Moving on the learning objectives for this topic, cutaneous mycosis will be basically the same as our objectives in superficial mycosis. So in this topic, the student is expected to be able to classify fungal diseases according to tissue predilection. So this will be uh, cutaneous tissues, hair, skin, and nails. So at the end, the student will be expected to be able to discuss well, the fungal uh, agents based on morphology and physiology, methods of transmission, pathogenesis and clinical manifestations, uh, methods of diagnosis, and prevention and control. Again, uh, methods of diagnosis as well as uh, treatment has been discussed in prelims before we covered superficial mycosis. So that will still be uh, used. You know? So do read that as well when you review, okay, but I will be touching lightly on methods of diagnosis still. Okay. So cutaneous mycosis are also known as dermatophytosis. Okay. So dermatophytosis are most commonly known by the term ringworm infections. Okay. Uh, they are called ringworm because the lesions of the rashes appear in a ring-like pattern. Right? But they're not caused by worms, they're caused by fungal elements. They're called dermatophytes. Okay? So uh, these dermatophytes usually affect the hair, the skin, the nails. And they have been observed to evoke uh, cellular immune responses, therefore expect pathologic changes on infected tissues. Okay? Now to differentiate, dermatomycosis are not synonymous with dermatophytosis. Dermatophytosis are those, those caused by dermatophytes. However, dermatomycosis is a general term which refers to fungal infections caused by a variety of fungal elements, most commonly candida. Okay. Now, to be able to uh, know more about the caustic agents of cutaneous mycosis, Okay, let's proceed with this. So dermatophytes are keratinophilic fungal elements, meaning they love feeding on keratin or in areas rich, rich in keratin, like the hair, skin, and nails. They're able to feed on keratin because they are able to produce keratinases. Okay? And remember, they are resistant to cyclohexamides. If you want to exclude them when you culture other fungal elements, remember that cyclohexamide will not work on them. So if you have placed cyclohexamide on the culture media, still dermatophytes will be able to grow if they are present in the specimen, okay? They are not able to grow, however, uh, at 37 degrees Celsius. Remember, dermatophytes are true molds. They are able to grow best at room temperature or around 25 degrees Celsius, okay? Uh, and they're also unable to grow in serum because serum, uh, ha as it has been found out, can actually contain growth inhibitors for dermatophytes. Okay. okay, so dermatophytes may be uh, classified in uh, three broad categories. Okay? So we have the anthrop uh, anthropophilic, like Epidermophyton and Trichophyton rubrum. These are species uh, uh, that are uh, present mostly in humans and can be passed on from one human, in one infected human to another. We have geophilic. These are those that uh, survive or thrive best in soil or soil containing material, like Microsporum gypsum. Zoophilic are those that thrive on animals, okay, on their fur, on their skin. Okay. Uh, this includes uh, Microsporum canis, which is uh, usually found on dogs and cats. Microsporum nanum, which is found on swine. Uh, and Trichophyton varicosum, which can be found both in horses as well as in swine. All of them are capable of infecting humans. Okay, so dermatophytes include epidermophyton, which can cause infections in hair, in skin and nails, trichophyton, 
which can uh, infect hair, skin, and nails, and microsporum, which is known to infect either hair or skin. So epidermophyton, trichophyton, and microsporum are the three known genera of dermatophytes. Okay, for pathogenesis and immunity, dermatophytosis is usually acquired through uh, contact, okay, direct contact with an infected individual or through fomites, okay, like in their clothing or uh, combs or brushes or um, beddings, towels, socks, underwear, okay? And of course, trauma, no? So trauma, this could be skin puncture or uh, contact sports, rough contact sports like wrestling where uh, people, people's skin gets abraded because of um, excessive um, pressure or tension, okay? And then Moisture, remember, it's a very important requirement for survival of fungal organisms. So um, if you live in crowded living conditions, you know, in very small houses, and there are 10 of you or more than 10 living in small quarters, okay? um, low socioeconomic backgrounds, which would render a lot of people unable to visit physicians for checkup. Okay, so this would allow um, a full manifestation of the infection. Okay? And then what else? So our environment is already warm and humid. Okay? Uh, if you wear the wrong type of clothing in this climate, that would just invite um, fungal agents like your mapophytes. Okay? So especially in uh, the crooks and folds of your body, okay? So uh, also when you wear clothing while your skin is still wet, that will also uh, satisfy you know, the moisture requirements. When you have to, when you need to put on socks, remember to dry in between your digits or when you put on pants, remember that your knee folds and your inguinal area or your groin area is already dry. When you wear your shirt, remember to wipe your armpits well, or those with um, gifted bosoms, those with large breasts, remember to keep the uh, submammary area dry you know, because um, that is one of the most common areas for fungal infection. You know, so, uh, under the breasts, the fold under the breasts, um, what else, uh, behind the knee, okay? Uh, in between your toes. Okay? So um, even if you don't live in crowded living uh, houses or conditions, but you practice okay, putting on clothing while your body is still wet, that can still satisfy the moisture requirement. Okay? So remember to put on the proper clothing for this type of climate, cotton, loose, okay? uh, avoid polyester, or rayon clothing, they don't absorb sweat that much or uh, very well, like cotton does. Okay, so uh, what else? If there's so many of you in a room or in a house, make sure to open windows. Okay, uh, make sure there's uh, circulating air you know, so that the moisture will evaporate okay, or you don't get to sweat too much because that will just um, put fungal elements in frenzy okay? so when you, they come in contact with your sweaty bodies or uh, sweaty folds. Okay? What else? Uh, cellular immunodeficiency. Okay? So um, those that are immunodeficient or those that are immune compromised may experience uh, severe forms or chronic forms of the infections. Okay? So for immune uh, competent individuals, they may simply be simple, treatable infections. But when the same uh, infections are uh, found on immune compromised individuals, they may be in their exaggerated or severe forms. Okay? And then 
uh, the dermatophytes are actually responsive to most of the antifungal treatments available, and they may e uh, they may be easily dissolved upon proper treatment. Okay? Or simply when we remove the stimuli, like when you clean your surroundings, when you change your beddings, when you don't borrow uh, materials from other people, or you don't, you remember to practice good hygiene by drying um, bodily folds. Okay? Fungal infection can actually dissolve on its own okay? in time. Okay? However, um, reinfection may still occur especially when you're introduced to a much larger uh, amount of inoculum. Okay? Now, when reinfection occurs, usually the course is shorter than when you were forced, are first exposed. Okay? So incubation period may run from one to two weeks, but when it's a reinfection, the course may be shorter. Okay? So the body, you know, the human body is known to be equipped with natural host defenses against dermatophytes. And this includes uh, serum growth inhibitors. That's why uh, they don't survive in serum because of this serum growth inhibitors for fungi. Um, the C-type lectin receptors that is responsible for signaling uh, immune response. And then uh, cellular immune response mediated by interleukin-17 and interferon gamma is also said to contribute to uh, anti-dermatophytic defense as well as skin inflammation control. Okay? And then of course we have our transferrin which is responsible for chelating iron. Okay? Uh, iron is a very important uh, nutritional requirement for fungal elements, especially for dermatophytes. Okay? But if our transferrin are actively chelating iron, so fungal agents that happen to enter your body may run out of iron that is important for their growth. Okay? And then of course, immunity varies in duration and degree. Uh, again, you know, to reiterate, immunity depends on the type of host, the infected site, and even the fungal species. Okay, so for immune competent individual, the infection may be simple and it may dissolve easily with proper treatment. However, it's a different story for immune compromise. Okay, so simple infections for healthy individuals may be severe chronic infections for immune compromised people. Okay? And then of course, uh, the infected site. No? So if the infected site involves um, deeper layers of the skin or deep tissues or oral cavities. Okay, so this may uh, take some time to heal and proper treatment, you no know, long proper treatment for dissolution of the infection. And of course, if the fungal species that causes the infection is virulent, okay, so even if the individual is immune competent, uh, the infection may still manifest because of the virulence of the agent, okay? For transmission, so as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, contact is a very important mode of transmitting uh, dermatophytic agents. So if you live in um, close living quarters, okay? so if you live, uh, there's so many of you in a small house, you borrow clothing, things like combs, brushes, towels, bed sheets, socks, underwear. Okay, so remember okay, in large bold letters, dermatophytes, kagid. Okay, dili magbaro kay kagid. So even if it's your sister or your brother, they won't be announcing you know, that they have ringworm infection. Okay, so as much as possible, use your own things, use your own combs, your brushes, your towels, and definitely your own underwear. Okay? And another thing, uh, animal to human contact is possible. No? So remember if you have pets at home, before you cuddle them, before you even touch them, before you sleep with them, again, remember in large bold letters, 
kagin. <laughs> because even if you think your pets are clean, you won't be able to watch them for 24 seven. So, you know, pets love to roll around in dirt and soil. Their fur may pick up something that may cause infection, okay? Incubation period again, one to two weeks. Okay, so moving on to clinical diagnosis. Okay, so clinical diagnosis, uh, the important thing there is to observe the appearance of the lesions or the rashes. Okay? And appearance may be checked with the presence of Wood's lamp. The ultraviolet light at 365 nanometers. Um, this is possible for dermatophytes that are able to fluoresce. Okay? Most may be able to fluoresce, but not all. Okay, so the usual fluorescent colors that they emit would be green or blue, some may be uh, purple okay? or pink, like this one. Okay? And then apart from viewing the appearance using Wood's lamp, you can also perform dermoscopy. So again, clinical diagnosis is by the way done by the clinicians or the doctors or the dermatologists in charge of your uh, condition. Okay? So in dermoscopy, the um, dermatologist may be able to observe closely okay, the telltale signs of your infections. It would help them um, you know, cut down okay, or rule out okay, other infections. So dermoscopy is also known as epiluminoscopy or uh, epiluminescent microscopy. Okay, so uh, this is one example of images viewed by your dermatologist when, look, uh, when performing dermoscopy. So this is uh, tinea captitis or ringworm of the skull. So your uh, dermatologist will be able to tell whether it's dandruff or alopecia or uh, true fungal infection. Okay. Of course, laboratory diagnosis. So this is where we come in. Direct microscopy, of course, comes first. We perform this on samples like skin, uh, nail scrapings, and epilated hairs. Um, the method mostly used is 10% potassium hydroxide, or you can use Parker ink with potassium hydroxide or calcofluor white with potassium hydroxide. Okay, remember, potassium hydroxide, because we need to remove uh, excess debris or excess keratin that may be present in your sample. Okay. So this is so that you'll be able to observe macroconidia and microconidia properly. Okay. So, oh, sorry. So what is micro and macroconidia? Okay. So uh, macroconidia are large, okay, multi-celled spores. Microconidia are single-celled, small spores. Okay. So microsporum is known to produce fusiform or spindle-shaped macroconidia like this one, okay? Uh, and they are known to produce microconidia, but in very few numbers, okay? So they mostly produce macroconidia. Trichophyton is actually the opposite, no? So they are able to produce macroconidia in different shapes, like uh, cylindrical or clavate, no? Or club-shaped forms or fussy form, but they mostly produce microconidia in clusters. That's trichophyton. Epidermophyton, on the other hand, is only known to produce macroconidia, the clavate-shaped uh, clavate macroconidia. Okay, clavate means uh, club shape. So fussy form, spindle shape, like this, okay? Tapering on both ends. Well, uh, epidermophyton can produce club shape. So one end is swollen while the other end is uh, tapered, okay? So again, microsporum, uh, mostly macroconidia, okay? And few microconidia, okay? Epidermophyton, only macro, no micro. Trichophyton, mostly micro but can produce macroconidia as well, okay? So going through them one by one. So microsporum is able to produce uh, mostly you know, multicellular macroconidia like this, okay? They look like uh, etil-etil, right? Okay, so 
their macroconidia can contain around 8 to 15 cells. Uh, it's thick walled and may have a curve or hook tip at the end like this. Okay? So curve or hook tip. They can produce microconidia, but very few or very rarely. Okay? Then we have trichophyton. No? So opposite, trichophyton mostly produce microconidia. They are known to produce macroconidia like this, no? multi-celled uh, spores, but very rarely. Okay, so their uh, microconidia are grape-like no? in clusters most of the time. Uh, they are also known to produce uh, coiled or spiral hyphae like this after primary isolation. Okay? And then uh, trichophyton cannot fluoresce under Wood's lamp. No? So one of uh, the groups of organisms that cannot, fungal organisms that cannot fluoresce under Wood's lamp. Lastly, we have epidermophyton. So epidermophyton is only is known to only produce macroconidia like this. Remember, clavate shape. So one end is swollen, while the other end is tapering like this. Okay, so they are not able to produce microconidia. Now for laboratory diagnosis, culture. Okay, so second step, culture. Okay, so for microsporum, okay, common agents include canis and gypsum. Canis is able to produce white, cottony surface uh, in the beginning. Okay? Eventually, it becomes slightly tan, especially on the center, okay? where the older uh, hyphae and mycelia is. Okay? On the reverse, it may be it may show deep yellow color. Gypsum is known to produce tan powdery colonies. Look at that. Okay, so powdery colonies. Um, and they, on the reverse, they produce yellow with orange brown center. Okay. For trichophyton, trichophyton can produce a white cottony surface and very common. Uh, they are able to produce deep red but non-diffusible pigment, okay, on the reverse part, okay. So the pigment is even visible on the surface, okay, but it's widespread on the reverse, okay. So tonsurans, uh, flat colonies, powdery to velvet, and then the reverse is reddish brown, okay. Then we have mentagrophytes, cottony to granular. So this one is actually granular or close to powdery. Okay. Remember, the older hyphae is found at the center. The younger hyphae is found at the edge. Okay. So trichophyton uh, is also um, easily differentiated when we culture them on secondary media, like trichophyton agar. So trichophyton is a secondary media. We use this for differentiation based on nutritional requirements. So uh, some trichophyton requires thiamine, like tonsurans and violation. Um, Verocosum would require thiamine and inositol, but rubrum, which is uh, the most common Okay, trichophyton agent needs no special vitamin requirement. Simple. Okay? It only requires base media. Okay? For epidermophyton, epidermophyton only has one known um, species, and that's epidermophyton flocosum. Flocosum can uh, produce uh, flat, okay? sometimes glabrous, okay? or velvety, uh, colonies that may be tan to olive green. Okay, so it becomes olive green as it ages. Okay. Now apart from micros uh, microscopy, culture, we can also perform physiologic tests. Okay. Like we can perform the hair perforation tests okay, or um, secondary cultivation using uh, try to fight on others, like mentioned earlier. So you can identify them based on special amino acid needs or vitamin requirements. We can perform uh, urea hydrolysis, growth on polished rice grains, temperature tolerance, and enhancement. And of course, okay, 
um, they may be differentiated by genomics okay, or with the use of PCR. Okay, moving on to clinical manifestations. Okay, so uh, on the skin, okay, the lesions may be circular or dry, erythematous or reddish, okay, scaly, and of course, itchy. Okay? So most of the lesions caused by dermatophytes are really itchy. Okay? On the hair or scalp, uh, scalp infection may uh, show carrion lesions or scarring. Some may show alopecia or hair loss. And of course, favus. Later, I will show you what carrion and favus look like. Okay? On nails, infected nails may appear thickened or deformed, uh, discolored, something, uh, sometimes yellowish or greenish gray. Uh, they may be weak because they're uh, cracking. Okay? And then, of course, the presence of the subungual debris underneath the nails. So you've seen this being scraped off underneath the nails in the uh, videos, in the video that I've shown you for specimen collection. Okay, so uh, that thing that they scrape underneath the nails is known as subungual uh, debris. Okay? So this actually contains um, uh, dead skin cells, okay? um, nail materials, okay? and fungal elements. Okay, so clinical classifications of dermatophytosis. Okay, so dermatophytosis or cutaneous mycosis are presented in a variety of forms. Okay, so we have tinea barbe or barber's itch. We have tinea corporis, tinea capitis or scalp ringworm, tinea fasciae or ringworm of the face, tinea cruris or jock itch, tinea pedis or athlete's foot, tinea manum or ringworm of the hand, and tinea ungium or onychomycosis. This is ringworm of the nails. Okay, so let's start with tinea pedis. Okay, so tinea pedis, uh, of course, affects uh, the foot. You know? It's an infection of the foot characterized by fissures like this, okay? cracks. Of course, scales like this. Okay? And uh, maceration in the toe web. Okay, so um, macerated skin tissue okay? in between the toe webs. Uh, scaling of the soles and lateral surfaces of the feet. There may be erythema like this, no? Red, uh, redness. Vesicles, postules may be present. Okay? So it's usually caused by uh, dermatophytic agents, uh, T. rubrum. Okay? It may be caused also by uh, trichophyton mentagrophytes, var interdigitale. Okay? And uh, epidermophyton flocosum. Okay, so rubrum is a very common agent of athlete's foot. Okay? Um, this one, okay, so the vesic vesicular type, is quite common in athletes or those that usually uh, wear sneakers and do sports, okay, so heavy training. So there may be uh, postures, okay? fluid filled lesions on the infected area. Okay? And then we have the moccasin type, which affects the entire plantar surface. Okay. It's called moccasin type because it looks as if you have soles okay, on you, or you have, um, you're wearing something on your feet. Okay. Then we have tinea manum or ringworm of the hands. Okay. So, uh, tinea manum is um, a dermatophytosis involving one hand, but occasionally both hands may be uh, affected. In this form, uh, the palms usually become diffusely dry, scaly, and erythematous. Okay? So it's most often caused by anthropophilic dermatophytes. Okay? Uh, cases may be an extension of athlete's foot. So it's said and believed. You know, that if an individual has uh, athlete's foot or ringworm of the uh, foot, it may uh, affect other areas like the hands. Okay? 
So occasionally, mesophilic organisms are also known to cause tinea mani. Okay? And again, the most common agent is trichophyton rubrum. Then we have tinea cruris, also known as jock itch. Okay? So uh, tinea cruris is the name used for the infection of the groin with a um, dermatophyte. It's most often seen in adult men, but women can also become uh, infected. Okay? So uh, this infection is commonly known as jock itch, primarily because a lot of uh, sporty, act uh, active you know, uh, men have this. Okay? So mostly those that wear really tight game pants, like those in the NFL, no? uh, football players that wear those really tight um, game pants or equestrian. Okay? Um, they're, uh, they're usually affected with this type of uh, infection, skin infection. Okay? So uh, infection uh, often comes from the feet again or the nail. So if you have athlete's foot, again athlete. Okay? So um, if an athlete has infection in the feet, it may actually spread to other parts of the body or ring, a nail, a ringworm infection of the nail. Okay? So that can also spread into the groin when we scratch that area. Okay? So originally it can be uh, spread you know, by scratching or the use of infected towels. So if you have athlete's foot and you use a towel to wipe it dry and then you use the same towel to wipe the inguinal area, that practice may introduce the infection on the foot into the inguinal area. Remember, the inguinal area is a really sensitive area. So it usually, uh, it easily gets infected by uh, dermatophytes. Okay? So the appearance of the infection is similar to ringworm okay? of the body. Sorry, ringworm of the body. Okay? So uh, the rash has a scaly re raised red uh, lesions or borders like this. Okay? So it can spread down the inner thighs from the groin or the scrotum. So in this illustration, you know, in this picture rather, uh, which is caused by the trichophyton rubrum downy strain, downy strain because the edges appear like feathers, okay? feathery edges. Okay? So, uh, it may start from the inner inguinal area or underneath the scrotum and may spread here, okay? And then it can also form um, uh, ring-like patterns on the buttocks like this, okay? Very granular, okay? So it's not often seen, in, uh, seen on the penis or the vulva or around the anus, thank God, okay? But from the looks of it, the infection is really, really itchy, okay? So uh, tinea cruris quite often recurs okay, after apparently successful treatment. So uh, reinfection is really possible. But to reduce the chance of reinfection, uh, you have to treat you know, your athlete's foot if you have it, treat that first, okay? Remember to dry the groin area after taking a bath with a different towel, okay? Do not use the towel that you have wiped your feet on. Okay? Use a different towel, a clean towel, because again, the inguinal area is quite sensitive, okay? Uh, do not share towels, do not borrow towels, okay? So wear your own personal clothing, your own underwear, do not borrow underwear from others. Avoid wearing occlusive or really tight uh, clothing or those synthetic ones. If you love wearing jeggings, which is really uh, the fad nowadays, remember to choose one that's snug fit, you know, comfortable, not too tight. Okay? And then another very good advice is that uh, if you're overweight or if you're one with those chunky, really big, um, meaty thighs, <laughs> that is prone to rubbing each other. Remember to try losing weight 
to reduce chafing and excessive sweating in the area. So even if you wipe your inguinal area dry after taking a bath, but because you have very big thighs and your thighs sweat too much because of the um, heat generated by you know, um, the muscles and the fats. So as much as possible, try to lose weight. Uh, and of course, that takes time. So while you're waiting to shed off some of those weight, remember to wear, to wear um, really comfortable clothing. Okay? Avoid wearing very tight clothing, especially if you have the infection already. The okay? chafing, by the way, in the vernacular is known as pilas. Okay? So if you keep wearing uh, tight-fitting clothes, okay? mapilasa, no? ang singit. Okay? So masakit yun, mahapdi. Okay? So to avoid that, from happening, use something that's light and comfortable to wear. Okay? So that, uh, especially if you have really large thighs that keep bumping on each other and you know creating friction. Okay? So wear something light and comfortable. Okay? Then we have tinea ungum or onychomycosis, ringworm of the nails. Okay? So, uh, again, this is a dermatophytic infection characterized by thickening, uh, discolored, um, broken, or dystrophic nails. The nail plate may be separated from the nail bed, like what you have seen in the video that I've shown you. Okay, the um, laboratory technologist was able to collect as much sample because the nail plate was already elevated from the nail bed. Okay. So it is usually caused by anthropophilic or uh, zoophilic dermatophytes. Again, the agent, common agent here is trichophyton rubrum. Mentagrophyte is also a very common agent. Okay. Then we have tinea uh, corporis. No? Tinea corporis is a uh, ringworm of the body or simply ringworm. Okay? So uh, tinea corporis is a superficial fungal infection of the skin okay? caused by a dermatophyte. So although it's a superficial infection, but since it is caused by a dermatophyte, hence it falls into this category, you know, cutaneous mycosis. So uh, it can affect any part of the body. Okay? It may exclude hands, feet, uh, skull, face, the beard, the groin area, and the nails, because we have separate terms for those areas. Okay, so it is commonly called ringworm. Okay, because of the characteristic ring-like patterns of its lesions. Okay, so uh, tinea corporis is predominantly caused by uh, the genera Trichophyton and Microsporum. Okay, the anthropophilic species Trichophyton rubrum is uh, again the most common um, causative agent. Okay? So although a lot of cases may be caused by uh, microsporum, still trichophyton rubrum is the number one causative agent. Okay? So tinea corporis is spread by the shedding of fungal spores from infected skin. Uh, transmission is facilitated by a warm, moist environment like the Philippines and the sharing of uh, fomites, including bedding, towels, and clothing. Um, dermatophyte infection elsewhere on the skin, uh, such as uh, tinea pedis or uh, at its foot, again can be transferred and cause tinea corporis. See? Okay, so. Uh, the fungal agent may simply be hiding in your, uh, in between your toes. Okay? So take care of your athlete's foot if you have it because it can spread and cause other forms of ringworm. Okay? Uh, the incubation period is one to three weeks. Uh, the dermatophyte invades and spreads in the stratum corneum, but is unable to uh, penetrate deeper layers in healthy skin. As long as the skin is healthy, as long as the individual is uh, immune 
competent, and this can be easily treated. Okay, so tinea corporis uh, initially presents a solitary uh, circular red patch. You know? So um, there may be only one ring-like lesion, but through time okay, or negligence, this may uh, produce you know, other uh, ring-shaped patterns and eventually they will coalesce producing one large lesion. Okay? So sometimes they may create uh, polycyclic patterns okay, or concentric rings. Mm. Okay? Uh, there may be uh, central hypopigmentation or the central area of the lesions may be lighter than the rest. And uh, this is because the margins or the borders are really uh, erythematous or really red and raised. Okay? So the treatment for this type of infection um, includes you know, uh, keeping the skin clean and dry. Again, use loose or comfortable clothing if you have this, since our uh, country is really humid and warm, hot. Okay, so remember to wear something that will absorb sweat and something that's really light. Okay? Avoid close contact with infected individuals if you know of any. And again, you know, uh, practice good hygiene. Do not borrow uh, fomites you know, or bed sheets or linens or towels from other people. Okay? Um, if um, you need to, as much as possible, borrow freshly washed or freshly laundered linens. Okay? Uh, what else? Recurrence again is common. Okay? Uh, oral treatment, the usual, no? so azoles uh, is quite efficient in treating. Uh, you can also use echinocandins. And uh, there's a, uh, another drug that was not included in the uh, three groups okay, that we were able to mention. No? Uh, we have the terbinafine. Terbinafine it works similar to azoles because they also inhibit synthesis of ergosterol, but unlike azoles that inhibit ergosterol synthesis because they um, compete no, in the binding, binding sites of a particular enzyme, terbinafine inhibits um, ergosterol synthesis by blocking or inhibiting a particular enzyme uh, further in the pathway of ergosterol synthesis. Okay? But you know, in the same manner, they inhibit ergosterol formation. Okay? So terbinafine works really, really well with itraconazole. Okay? So that's a very good uh, treatment for um, tinea corporis. Okay? So note, okay, they may start with one ring, eventually other rings may form and they will create one large uh, lesion. Okay, so this is actually from a toddler, a two-year-old boy, I believe. Uh, he got it from an infected kitten. Okay, and so it's a zoophilic infection already. Okay, so take note if you have pets, especially cats, especially kittens. Okay, kittens are said to be more prone to um, dermatophytes. Okay. And then this is a diffuse type of infection. Probably the child is immune compromised. Okay, so that's why child, because, you know, okay. And then uh, this is submammary inflammation. So underneath the breast part. Okay? So if, if you're a little big bodied and you have a generous um, bosom, okay? so check underneath those things for fungal infection. Okay. Now, tinea corporis is known to present um, several variants. Okay. So we have the carrion. Okay. So it's an inflammatory form of tinea corporis or uh, tinea gladiatorum, which is uh, quite the common form. It's uh, most commonly observed in uh, individuals who practice contact sports, you know, especially wrestling. 
And then we have uh, Tinia Incognita or Tinia Incognito in some references. So it usually occurs when uh, taking or after taking inappropriate treatment, usually a topical steroid or cream. Okay, so using inappropriate fungal treatment may lead to tinea incognita. Okay? And then we have uh, tinea imbricata. Okay? Tinea imbricata um, is characterized by extensive concentric rings, so very evident in this picture. Okay? So they form uh, polycyclic plaques you know, with very thick scales. Okay? And uh, this particular type is very itchy. It can actually cover the entire body. If you Google the pictures of uh, tinea imbricata, you'll be able to see you know, several types wherein some individuals actually sport these uh, rings all over their body. I cannot imagine how itchy that is. Okay. And of course, uh, myokis granuloma. Okay. So it's pronounced as myoki. Okay. Myokis granuloma is the invasive type of tinea corporis. Okay, so invasive type of tinea corporis. It's commonly observed or found on the limbs after shaving. Okay, so if you are fond of shaving your uh, body hair, particularly in your legs or your arms, make sure the shave that you'll be using is your own and that it's clean. Okay? You can use disposable ones, that's better. So you don't want to get uh, this type of infection. Okay. Moving on, we have tinea barbe or barber's itch. Okay. Uh, commonly affecting the beard area or the mustache area. Therefore, it's common in men. Okay. So lesions uh, may include scaling, follicular postures, uh, and uh, erythema. Okay, so it may be red, heavily scaling, heavy scaling rather, and then uh, postures are present. Okay, so it's caused by zoophilic or anthropophilic dermatophytes. Uh, farm workers are often affected by this type of infection. Then we have tinea fasciae. Uh, it's usually seen on the non-bearded parts of the face. It's cheeks, on the nose, on the forehead, near the ears. Okay, so the lesions are usually pruritic or very itchy. Okay? There's uh, that itching and burning sensation that comes with the lesions. Okay? So they resemble, uh, the lesions may resemble tinea corporis. Okay? It may start out as uh, ring-like lesions. Eventually, it may uh, create an irregular uh, shape and may spread out across the face. Okay, so uh, some may have little or no scaling. Some may just show uh, raised edges. Okay. In some cases, uh, the areas are uh, slightly discolored. Okay. No redness, no uh, papules or postures, or lucky. Okay for some to have that type. Okay. But for this boy, look, okay, the lesions here are really red, raised. Okay. His ears are also affected. For the girl, slightly raised. Okay. There may be some papules okay. and then diffuse. Okay. So it's a, it appears to be spreading out. Okay. Sometimes this may lead to misdiagnosis. No? It could be uh, misdiagnosed as lupus. Okay? So lupus can create uh, a scar on the face, okay? spreading out like butterfly. Uh, so it may be, this type may be misdiagnosed or it could be misdiagnosed as psoriasis. Okay? Then we have tinea capitis or ringworm of the skull. Okay, so tinea capitis is, uh, of course, you know, a dermatophytic infection involving the skull you know, and uh, hair. So it's known as scalp ringworm also. Okay, symptoms of this infection include uh, hair loss, the presence of dry, scaly areas, of course, redness, and 
uh, itchiness in the area. Okay, so uh, this type of infection is prevalent between uh, children aged three to seven. Okay? Uh, it is slightly more common in boys than in girls, primarily because boys love, love to roll around in dirt, you know, uh, much more so than the girls. Okay? So infection by um, T tonsurans may occur in immune compromised adults, but again, it's common in children rather than in adults. But of course, if an individual is immune compromised, most of the time, even it, if, in, if it's not for them, they may have it. Okay? Risk factors include, of course, again, animal contact, household crowding, uh, lower socioeconomic status. No? They cannot go to the doctor as much as they want to because they don't have uh, the finances. No? And then warm, humid environments, and of course, contact sports. Okay. So anthropophilic infections uh, caused by tonsurans are common in uh, crowded living conditions. Okay. So the fungi may contaminate hair brushes, the clothing, the towels, the backs of seats. So remember, ladies, if you usually ride the taxi, you know, going somewhere, going places, Remember, most of the taxis uh, mm. seat covers are made of uh, cloth rather than um, leather. Okay, so it's more prone to collecting fungal agents. Okay? So if you're going to ride the taxi, remember to pull your head, your hair up, tie it up. Okay, what else? Mm. Uh, zoophilic infections are due to, of course, direct contact with an infected animal. No, it's uh, less likely to be passed on from one person to another if the causative agent is zoophilic. Okay? Uh, geophilic infections usually arise when working in uh, infected soil. Okay? But sometimes this can also be transferred from an infected animal. So again, uh, if you have um, pet cats or kittens, remember to bathe them first before you hug them or cuddle them. Okay? They might be carrying dermatophytic agents. Okay? So in Asia, as well as in Europe, the most common agent is the zoophilic species, Microsporum canis, again, in cats. Okay? So trichophyton tonsurans, uh, which is anthropophilic, is more common in the US. Okay? So in Asia, Microsporum canis, in U.S., uh, tonsurance is quite uh, common. So, um, capitis may be presented in a variety of manner. So we have here the carrion. Again, this is an inflammatory type of ringworm infection characterized by erythematous lesions, okay? um, hair loss. Okay? The hair loss may become permanent if not properly treated. Okay? What else? There may be postules, okay? um, bleeding or uh, weeping lesions. Okay? And then we have a dry scaling areas like this resembling dandruff. Okay? And then the difference is that in dandruff, there's no hair loss. There's just scaling and itchiness probably. But in tinea capitis, there's heavy scaling, itchiness, and typical hair loss, okay? And then there's favus, no? uh, black dots, no? so black dots first. Black dots are actually uh, broken hair, okay? So broken hair, so that's also a sign of uh, tinea capitis. And then of course, Favus. Okay? So Favus is actually a rare chronic inflammatory infection caused by uh, Schonlini. This one. Okay? So it's caused, most commonly caused by Schonlini. Uh, it's characterized by matted hair and formation of yellow crusted cup shaped lesions. Mm. Okay? So they usually appear at the base of the hair. Okay? So this uh, crusts actually contain hyphae and keratin debris. Okay? So it may start out as a few, no? uh, 
uh, individual or pockets of uh, uh, yellow crusts, eventually this yellow crust will uh, coalesce and produce a large mat of crusts. Okay. If this is left untreated, it will cover the entire head. Okay. It appears as if the kid is wearing a beanie. Okay. So common agent is canis, tonsurans, uh, and odoni. Okay, so uh, tinea capitis infection usually um, may be presented in, or may include rather, infection of the hair. Okay. So following invasion of the keratinized stratum corneum of the skull, uh, the fungi may grow downwards into the hair follicle and uh, the hair shaft. Okay. So it may penetrate the hair cuticle and typically invade the hair shaft in um, several ways. One is via endothrix infection. So here, the dermatophyte invades the hair shaft and grows within it. Okay? So the fungal spores are retained inside the hair shaft, but the cuticle is not destroyed. So you can see the cuticle is still intact, but inside okay, the hair shaft is already filled with spores. Okay? So um, this is typical of trichophyton tonsurans. Okay? So they do not fluoresce with Woods light. Okay. Another is via the ectothrix infection. Okay, so uh, ectothrix in fact, in ectothrix infection, the dermatophyte grows uh, within the hair follicle, and it covers the surface okay, of the uh, hair. Now the fungal spores are evident on the outside of the hair shaft. Okay, so they're on the hair shaft, they can destroy cuticle in that manner. Okay? So this is typically caused by microsporum canis. Okay? This one can fluoresce under wood's light. Okay? So complications of um, tinea capitis. So alopecia can result in uh, psychosocial distress for the patient especially when uh, scarring alopecia no, uh, occurs following inflammatory tinea capitis or uh, carrion infection. Okay. So the um, areas, no, hairless patches may be permanent. Okay. So then we have the dermatophytid or the id reaction. Okay. This is a generalized acute cutaneous reaction or allergic response to fungal antigens. It may be, uh, it may create rashes in other parts of the body apart from the infected area. So uh, say for example, the infection is on the scalp, the id reaction may create rashes or lesions on other parts of the body, okay, the torso. Okay, so this is uh, usually seen in uh, hypersensitive individuals. Okay? So caused by excessive um, release of cytokines, chemokines, those chemical agents responsible in launching immune response. Okay? So if they are uh, hypersensitized, if your immune cells releasing those uh, substances are hypersensitized, they may affect uninfected parts of the body. Okay, so that's what we mean by dermatophytid or id reaction. Now, so to differentiate dermatophytid or the id reaction from actual fungal infection, we perform microscopy, of course, laboratory diagnosis. Okay? We perform micros uh, microscopy and culture. The id reaction, the lesions caused by id reaction is negative for both culture and microscopy, meaning we won't be seeing hyphae or conidia under the microscope and there will be no growth. If any, it would be bacterial growth uh, uh, carried over, normal flora carried over on the uh, culture media, but no fungal growth, okay? So to differentiate 
some more, you can perform a trichophytin skin test. So trichophytin skin test, your ID reaction will uh, turn out negative. Okay, so additional tests for capitis. So we, we have uh, mentioned this earlier under clinical diagnosis. So dermoscopy may be done while waiting for culture results. Okay? So this can help in uh, uh, identifying uh, fungal agents or fungal infection as well. Okay? So uh, dermoscopy is actually a fast, non-invasive procedure, very useful in confirming tinea capitis and other uh, types of tinea infection as well. Okay? So examples of uh, dermoscopic findings with very high predictive value for tinea capitis includes uh, comma hairs okay, like this. Okay? So these are short hairs that bend and grow back into the scalp, resembling a comma. So this one, this one. So instead of growing out, um, the hair grew back, bended and grew back into the scalp. What else? Uh, corkscrew hairs like this. Okay? So short hairs are uh, coiled up like a, oh, like a corkscrew. It's also um, predictive of tinea capitis. And then we have uh, zigzag hairs like this, okay? zigzag hairs. Uh, short hairs with several bends in them, creating that zigzag pattern. And of course, the barcode hairs. Okay, so very short hairs, around 1 mm, or shorter even than 1 millimeter. Okay, so barcode-like hairs, standing in a line, um, mimicking a barcode. So this is the dermoscope. Okay, so the dermoscope may be attached to your phone, okay, and then the larger image will appear on your phone. Or like this, some dermoscope are attached to a monitor to provide better vision, both for the patient and the uh, clinician or the dermatologist. So treatment, not only for tinea capitis, but for the, the rest of other tinea infections. So Grishifulvin may be very effective, uh, but in some areas without Grishifulvin, terbinafine is uh, also effective. Okay, so remember again, um, Terbinafine does not fall under pauline or azoles or echinocandines, but they work similar to azoles in the aspect that they inhibit ergosterol uh, synthesis. Okay. So it works really well also with itraconazole and fluconazole may also be used. For topical treatment, uh, povidone iodine washes may be helpful. Uh, uh, ketoconazole shampoo, you know, like nizoral, uh, selenium sulfide shampoo. It can be used on the skull or on the skin. Okay? So selenium sulfide can uh, be used for treating uh, infected skin other than the skull. Okay? And then, of course, uh, general uh, treatment you know, procedures that may be helpful for controlling tinea. Okay, so if one member of a household turns positive, uh, all members must be tested or screened. If any of those screened members appear positive, so they should be treated simultaneously, not one after the other, okay, simultaneously. Remember, no sharing of personal things and make sure your pets are clean before you cuddle them. Have, it, have them checked by your vet. Okay? So just uh, to um, be on the safe side. So even if you love your pets, I know some of you are pet lovers, remember dermatophytes kagid in large letters before you embrace them, okay? Because again, uh, the idea is we can't keep our eyes on our pets 24-7, okay? We can't watch them all the time, every minute. So. To be safe, remember to keep them clean, bathe them before sleeping. If you really want to sleep with them, 
make sure they're clean because your pets will love to roll around in soil and infected or contaminated areas. So to summarize, our topic for today was cutaneous mycosis. These are caused by a group of fungal elements called dermatophytes. They are keratinophilic. They are true molds and prefer to uh, survive in um, room temperature 25 degrees Celsius. This includes the genera Microsporum, Trichophyton, and Epidermophyton. Diagnostic methods used to identify them is uh, clinical diagnosis, checking out the appearance of the lesions or the rashes via Wood's lamp and dermoscope. Okay? And of course, laboratory uh, diagnosis involves microscopic evaluation, culture, uh, physiologic tests, yeah? and of course, PCR if you have it. Okay? So uh, dermatophytosis includes tinea capitis or ringworm of the skull, uh, tinea fasciae, ringworm of the face, tinea barbe or barber's itch, tinea corporis or um, ringworm, no? simply ringworm, tinea manum or ringworm of the hand, tinea cruris, ringworm of the inguinal area or the groin or simply jock itch, uh, tinea pedis or athlete's foot, and tinea ungum or ringworm of the nails or onychomycosis. Okay, so I hope that you're again able to enrich your knowledge on uh, fungal elements. Thank you for listening. See you next lecture session.